four one. It's JB. What are we thinking, bud? <sighs> Talked about this with the last pick, but I'm I'm loving taking the shots in the running backs here. If I didn't go high with three oh one, you know, I talked about Chase Brown maybe. Uh Izzy went there at 309. I like that a lot. Evan Hall, even though it's kind of a weird situation with the Russian quarterback, and you got Jonathan Taylor there in Indianapolis. But at 401, I, I took a shot on Eric Gray. Wide open running back depth chart after Saquon Barkley. As of now, what he hasn't signed the franchise tag yet, guys. Is he going to? Are they going to work a longer term deal? Maybe. But you get Eric Gray. These are all dart throws. But. I want to take a running back that we could potentially see a spike in value for one reason or another. And I always say this, you look at the guys during the season that got moved for future seconds. I mean, I saw it with Jarek McKinnon last year. I saw it with Jeff Wilson. You see it with lower end running backs that produce because they got an opportunity that very well could be an Eric Gray that I'm snagging here at 401 because something either happens to Saquon Barkley, uh, the contract, discussion stall and he doesn't sign that franchise tag i really though i I believe he something will work out and he's going to be playing for the giants here in 2023 but uh at 401 give me a running back that that could have an opportunity competing with matt Breida and oh who else is there Wow, oh, I'm drawing ah, a blank. Ah, we'll just throw. Ah, we'll go Wayne Gallman. I know he's not there anymore, but it's for not, a long it's time, not, he was Wayne. It's not the Wayne train, but anyway, I, uh, Eric Ray. I interesting to me here uh, at 401 for the Giants. Yeah, um, so that's well, like an analytical thing, right? To get these running backs in the third and fourth rounds, right? That's like y'all's play kind of thing, right? You, it's not, it is the hit rate with wide receivers in those rounds is not good. So you, you're trying to get that value bump with the, the running backs who can get drafted later in the NFL draft and still pop. It, it is right. And it all comes down to opportunity. Like ultimately when you go through and you look at the running backs that might've gone later in drafts, uh, the longer term value, it certainly isn't there. Not to say that any running back really has that much long-term value, but especially these guys. But if they do get the opportunity, there is that sell window and there is the ability to maximize and profit off of them. Whereas if you go and look at the wide receivers, I mean, uh, wide receivers that have gone in the fifth round of the NFL draft to have any impact at all over the last seven years, it's Darnell Mooney, Hunter Renfro, and there's one more, which I had it up but uh, uh the, yeah uh, gary brightwell and corbin are the other uh brightwell was the the one i was thinking of but we just don't really see these these lower draft pick wide receivers you know round four top 110 picks or so you're just looking at Amon ross st brown but once you get later like darnell mooney hunter renfro that's it going back to 2017 that have had any type of production once you're looking at guys like Puka, uh, I see Michael Wilson, even though he was a third round pick, but I thought he was a weird third round pick in the NFL draft. Xavier Hutchinson, uh, Boutte. I didn't mean to laugh there, but um, <laughs> <laughs> that was rude of me. That was rude. But, uh, you know, give me the running backs, plain and simple. And it is more of an analytics play, you know, especially if you're, you're filling out your roster. I prefer to get those later round running backs as opposed to the wide receivers. So, so who's your other uh, fourth round shots here that you'd like to take? I got a lot of Deuce Vaughn, Chris Rodriguez in two PPR, Tennessee Titans, fifth round tight end, Josh Wiley. Mm-hmm. Um, actually, his profile was was uh, had some similarities to to Chicky Conquo. I know that everybody's excited about him because of his yards per route run, the limited opportunity he had in 2022. I'm pretty and, excited because when I watched him, he was good at football. I mean, I, and, you, know. <laughs> you know what? I'm never coming back. I hate this school and I hate all of you. <laughs> Another, uh, uh, what is that? Billy Madison. Well, yeah, he's, uh, he, you know, but he is under 6'3. So Scott Connor has a problem with that. He, he says, you know, he can't, there's only, a certain percentage of those guys that hit, so you might as well just flush him down the toilet. Well, so. that six three thing that that gets me though, because Sam Laporte is six three, and I love mm. Sam. Mm. So we no, gotta pick no. and choose when we that's when we right. look that's at right. those warts, right? Right. 
<laughs> McBride, Tucker. Uh, I feel like you did like Tucker a little bit. Any? He's not a fourth round stab for you. I, I I had him. I was taking him at one twelve pre NFL <laughs> draft. Yeah, and then you Took get the glasses medicals. off. <laughs> I know. Listen, I like Sean Tucker, and I'm rooting for him. But the dude went undrafted. Yeah. The NFL well, fourth round a shot, shot, though. I mean, it's kind of an open depth chart. If you want to take him in the fourth, okay. I've seen some people take a stab in the third. Mm. I, what's going on? That. Yeah. <laughs> no, what, what's going on? But you want to take a stab in the fourth, fine. But I, I would still go with a running back that got drafted with a, a decent profile as opposed to uh, Sean Tucker, who I mean, the dude didn't get drafted. Dead. Dead to me. Yeah, huh? Well, well, JB, what about James Robinson? What, well, you know, like, little... <laughs> was, was Arian, Arian Foster? Foster. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, if on, Sean bro. Tucker ends up being Arian Foster, I'll I'll do something. I don't know. Just, you know, maybe the medicals uh, got him. You know, I don't. Who knows? But I'll tell you what. A good third round shot is 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 Luke Schoonmaker. If you if you get him in the third round, that is a good draft. I I like Shun. Um, <laughs> it's a, like how many? Like it is a broken record tonight, guys. How many situations are we going to talk about where hey, it's wide open for this guy? Mm-hmm. Like Shunmaker gets second round draft capital because the Dallas Cowboys, who you know they, they they lose Dalton Schultz, but you have Ferguson, you have Hendershot. So, oh. it, it, but it's oh. wide open. <laughs> right? But it's wide open. Right. So many yeah. of these guys, you just talk about Sean Tucker. There, there's yeah. potential there. Right. Um, right. You know, Eric Gray talked about him with the Giants. Uh, I mean, Evan Ingram, he hasn't signed his franchise tag yet. Brighton Strange goes in the second round. You know, mm-hmm. so if we're looking at tight end premium, that's that's yeah. somebody there. But uh, sure. well, this is a good little segue here, because I'll tell you what I what I like is that I think the last time we talked. You were a proponent of selling the like basically like two six and later. You're like, this draft's gonna come and these guys are gonna get eaten up. And now it seems like you're um, back in. He's yeah, he ha- you have to make picks in this mock draft. I don't know if that seems the case. like well, I mean, but the way he was talking, he said he was trading back up and in. So I I like I think we got is there a little shift there? There's a shift because league mates allowed there to be a shift. Mm. Tank Bigsby shouldn't be going 212. Roshan Johnson shouldn't be slipping to the end of the second either. You know, so I'm looking at these guys. For me, that break should be at 209 when, it, when it's all said and done. If if the draft went the way I have it, give me Jay Bur- the JB's correct world. way. Yeah, give me JB's world's draft and, and let me tell you that you're wrong, that it's got to be after 29. No, I'm just kidding, uh, but I would like to know. No, no, no. Bijan, Richardson, Bryce, Stroud, Gibbs, JSN, Addison, A Chain, Quentin Johnson, Zay Flowers. This is 1.5 PPR. Dalton Kincaid, Charbonnet, Kendra Miller, Jonathan Mingo, Will Levis, Michael Mayer, Tank, Jaden Reed, Roshan Johnson, Sam Laporte, Tajay Spears. Break. This is when you get into the wide receivers. Downs, Hyatt, Mims, Rice, Tillman. Uh, and I actually have Shun. I have Shoemaker at 304. Well, so I think you've got so, a great value there. So, yeah, so you didn't have Mims in that top, the 209 break there. No. Huh. And was Downs in there? Nope. No. Mims oh, the and capital, Downs. The and capital on Downs. I, I have the Walking JP's world. <laughs> I have the, too, right? were you Were you a Downs guy? Uh, this remember. is another motherfucker I thought was going to go top 40. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, but... Uh, day, day two, though, right? Day two, but there, there is, there is a very clear break hit rate uh, wise from top forty on. There is. I'll set you free. And and uh, is there a percentage with that hit rate or like you 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 can't put how many how many like wide this. receivers hit? It, you don't need to that's a, that's after a, top top forty. Get, that's a, that's a question i'm sure you have an 15 percent you know 20 hold, hold on hold on so let 49. going back to 2017 Can't be let's funny. let's go second round because i don't want to include first round picks because that's certainly going to skew it right like do you want me to include this is what first i was round? talking about you guys gave me all that shit about photoshopping <laughs> Well, this is, well, you know, I can't do the first round. Let's get things up. I mean, I, I'm trying to make a point. 
<laughs> no, 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 no. It's going to skew it in my direction. Oh, okay. It okay. is, yeah. But we look at the top 40 picks in the second round. We got T. Higgins, Elijah Moore, Michael Pittman, Christian Watson, Debo Samuel, uh, Zay Jones, Cortland Sutton, Curtis Samuel. Then we go into LaVisca Chenault, Wandell Robinson, Dante Pettis, John Mechie, KJ Hamler, Christian Kirk, Rondell Moore, Chase Claypool, Tyquan Thornton, AJ Brown. So I'm not saying they're dead. I'm not saying they're dead. Who two at will? Uh, yeah, two two. Jeez, oh man. I don't know if he's top forty, but I don't know. No, he was fifty seven. Mm. But like there, there, there is a break. Yeah. All right. I do m- like the order that you had in that second round. For the, you know, I'd move some things around, but those are probably a, around the guys that have at the nine break. I'd probably throw Mims and down up a little higher, but. Yeah, I, I, I'm down with it. So, you know, I can, I guess I can, I can relax now. I, but I'm, I'm glad that, I'm glad that you maybe came around and, you know, that he didn't back. come around. People were messing it up. They got their people are messing wrong. That's part of the game. That's part of the game. You have to listen. Big Co. Big listen, Co. He was Big trying Co. to get into the second round, not the third or fourth. Big Co. That's kind nice, of what our argument was about. Has a nice time. little rant of, you know, just giving people too much credit sometimes when you're in drafts and that can lead to problems when you're just you're, you're giving people too much credit so you know obviously you want to play it kind of close to the vest but you know there is every draft is going to have errors that's 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 why you get when you need to be able to know where they are and capitalize and it, it, it's you know one reason why yes like i i love the the spreadsheets and the analytical approach sure but the human element is always going to throw the unexpected wrench right into it. It's going to throw that sand into the microchip, right? So if I'm sitting here looking at it from a tier-based perspective, which I do, and I'm sitting there pre-draft, pre-rookie draft, post-NFL draft, I'm like, all right, I got to get up to that 209. So I have 211, right? I'm going to do 211, 302, this, that, and the other, just to get up to 209 because there's that big tier break. Yeah. And then tanks there at 211 when I could have had them all all along. Right. So – I just, man, I, I can't believe you got tank at two twelve. Yeah, I mean, I feel, it feels like that's again where I do end up seeing tank anywhere from two, mm-hmm. two nine to two twelve, which I'm more than happy to. I, I had tank high beforehand, and I, you know, they, they, they want to use two guys even regardless if, you know, there isn't an injury there. At that, Peterson made that pretty apparent to me last year, and uh, things could change. And maybe and et was there's all sorts of efficiency, efficiency metrics out there about how how good he was, and I think et is a good player. It's not a knock that I don't have faith in et. I think the staff itself has shown me until they show otherwise that they want to use two guys, and they just drafted another guy who they can you know get different usage out of. And he's I I always really liked him because I thought the receiving was underrated. I thought mm-hmm. people didn't give him enough love in the receiving game, and. You know, I think he has moves and he, he he's a different player than ETN. And I, I think he's got standalone value even, you know, by himself without an injury. And then, like you said, if there is an injury, which I don't want to happen because I do have ETN a, a decent amount. Right. But I, I, I really like Tank and, you know, Roshan is is another one. I, I, I think I like Roshan a little or Tank a little more than Roshan personally. Me too. Um, but it's, it's a similar situation. But, you know, one thing. You know, I don't, maybe I don't know who we talked about it with, but with Roshan, you know, it could almost be one of those things where you could maybe buy back in a little later. Whereas a guy like Herbert, who's been there and played in that in that system, and and now you brought in Foreman, who's been really good, who they paid, they didn't pay him crazy, but they brought him in. We got to remember that Roshan's only been playing the running back position for a short amount of time, so this acclimation to the league may take a minute where he misses some stuff in training camp. Where and he's a hardworking guy from everything. I, I'm not saying that he's he's not going to get it because I think he will and he's he's a good athlete. But like maybe there could be a little buyback in window with Roshan because he's not getting the play and somebody's upset that they drafted him in the second round. It's it's a lot of Herbert and just a little bit of Roshan mixed in because maybe he does make some errors in training camp and when he gets in there the first couple times we we see that shit you know happen all the time. Especially you know again he hasn't been playing all that long so I don't know how we got here but let's let's get everybody out of here. Uh, did you have anything else to say on, on the topics that I just touched on? On the topics you touched on, no. Could I talk about okay. anything else with you guys? Because yeah. it's a blast. Yes, yeah. but let, let's let's move. Let's, All right. Let's All get right. going. This is what happens. You're, you're, this is why you know you're part of the team because this is how we operate, and we'll just be in. All of a sudden, we're in left field. But JB, always a pleasure. Give us one more plug uh, before you get out of here. Yeah, guys, uh, always 
you know, love jumping on here, talking with you guys. Thanks for allowing me to take part in this mock. It was a lot of fun. Uh, find me on Twitter at the Bauer Club. One of the hosts of Dynasty Theory at Dynasty Theory FF on both Twitter and Instagram. We got the Patreon. We got the Discord. Also, check out my guys Mitch Sorensen at Dino MC and Dan Lamagna at FF Coach Dan on Twitter. This is a lot of fun. All right, buddy. Appreciate you, Matt Hicks with his last pick at four two. Uh, again, still, I've liked all the picks down the board. This, you, those were pretty much all the selections I would have made. So we're we're seeing eye to eye here. Let's see if uh, if we can go four for four. All right, man. Listen, fourth round, my guy territory. I'm going to take one of my guys, and that's Puka Nakua. You know, I liked him a lot all the way through the draft process. I think he is a really versatile guy. He works well along the boundary. He's physical. He has great hands, good catch radius, and utilized a lot on the ground as well. Five rushing touchdowns to go with five receiving touchdowns in his final season at BYU. Good field vision, physical runner, used a lot in the end zone. You know, not just an end around guy, like lining up as a running back, being effective in the red zone. So super fun player. Obviously doesn't get high draft capital, which is why we're taking him in the fourth round. But I just described a super creative, versatile player. And now you're giving me him in Sean McVay's offense. Like, yeah. we got a little juice here, guys. So at 402, this is the type of guy I want. Yeah, I, I agree. And it seems like, you know, kind of like you talked with Hyatt. I mean, yes, we have, we have obviously Cooper Cup in this offense. And, you know, then it's Van Jefferson and <laughs> Ben Skaronsky. And, you know, right. you know, so it's, it is pretty open, man. It was just, and, and Puka's got, uh, some skill set to to kind of go along with that. So, you know, I, I, I very much agree with this pick as well. You were talking uh, beforehand about Eric Gray. So he would have been a pick for you um, if if available over Puka. Yeah, man, um, that's a tough one. You know, that's a really tough one because I'm a big fan of Eric Gray as well. You know, every year you get like two or three running backs with quote, good landing spots. So, you know, for a day three guy, Eric Gray gets a pretty good landing spot because I, I like his skill set. I think he has the physicality, the ability to run in between the tackles, the shiftiness, the vision to be able to carry a, a strong workload if Barkley is off the field, right? Which is always what you're looking for or what I'm looking for, I should say, with running backs in late round selections, right? If there's an injury ahead, if there's a suspension ahead of him on the depth chart, could he step in and be the running back one? And I think Eric Gray could because it's a pretty shallow depth chart in New York past Saquon Barkley, and I really like his skill set. Um, so, you know, Eric Gray is definitely up there. Um, it probably comes down to a little bit of roster construction and need here between running back and wide receiver. If it's Gray, I'm probably taking him as early as the mid to late third round where I've been finding I can sit back in the fourth and take Puka. There's just generally less demand for him. Yeah. All right. And then uh, one of the last questions here before we get out of here, who, who would be some of your other fourth round uh, dart throws? And I've been trying to get a little more information on on Michael Wilson. Is there any consideration for him there uh, getting some decent draft capital, obviously being a little banged up, not playing a whole lot, but gives that offense some size over there. Seems to be a little bit of the punching bag in, in this fourth round here for, through some guys. So wanted to get your thoughts on him and then some of your other favorite stabs in the fourth year. Yeah, Michael Wilson, there's a little bit of juice there. You know, he was a very athletic player, uh, didn't ever have high production at Stanford, but was a high recruit, very athletic. A series of injuries plus a really boring um, Stanford offense yeah. didn't do him any favors. But if you look at the tape, man, you see somebody that's athletic. You see somebody with a really great catch radius. You see somebody who can do a little bit something with the ball in his hands after the catch. So now you combine that with pretty good draft capital and – it may look a little crowded now, but this Arizona Cardinals roster is in transition, right? So we could be looking in a year from now where Michael Wilson could have a shot at 15 plus percent of the market share in Arizona. And if there's a healthy Kyler Murray back, all of a sudden, maybe there's some things working. So I think at the end of the day, man, if you're taking somebody with day two draft capital in round four, that's not too bad of a fit, right? Yeah, um, for sure. Yeah. Some of the other guys, you know, I'd be looking at here in, in the fourth round. I like A.T. Perry. I like his landing spot. You know, I was not the highest guy on A.T. Perry coming through the draft or, or into the draft, I should say. But after the draft, you know, with the Saints, we're looking at a pretty good market share opportunity. I think he complements well um, what 
you know, Chris Olave does. And, you know, quite frankly, guys, at the end of the day, if Rashid Shahid uh, can end up being fantasy relevant, then A.T. Perry can, right? Yeah. Um, so I, I think there's a little bit something there with him. Um, Parker Washington, I also like. Not a great landing spot, but I really like his talent in terms of being a physical guy that played out of the slot with really nice hands. There's talk of him potentially being – you know, uh, even converted into a little bit of a running back type role. Antonio Gibson has kind of been comp to him and, and what the Jaguars might want to do with him. So he's a fun guy uh, to, to look at late round as well. Um, so those are, you know, a couple of the guys. Sure. If you don't stop me, I could name 15. Of them. <laughs> it happens. It, it'll get on you quick. Uh, well, blacked out there for a second. What happened? <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> well, I, I really like the draft and uh, let the let the people out there know where, uh, they can find more of this really strong insight here that you provided through these uh, four picks, man. Yeah, man. If you're looking for rookie content, we're doing it all year round. Dynasty Devi feeding into it as well at patreon.com slash rookie big board. We're on YouTube, rookie big board on your favorite podcast provider, rookie big board. Uh, so, you know, if, if this is the type of content that you're looking for more of all year round, this is what we're doing. Uh, you know, would be happy to have you uh, check us out. Yeah, go throw my man a couple bucks. He's out there working hard. He's already on the 24 class, for Christ's sake. You know, give my guy some love. All right, Matt, we very much appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. In the fourth round, man, Deuce Vaughn. Deuce Vaughn out of Kansas State, right? He's writing us a lot about Darren Sproles with the Kansas State alumni connection, but he's a player, I think, that can have a significant role in the Cowboys' backfield after Tony Pollard because – what else is there? You know, you have Ronald Jones, you have a couple other ancillary pieces, but you don't have a guy like Deuce Vaughn who can be a prolific pass catcher, play on third downs and play sort of that joker hybrid type role as a runner receiver. Um, I think he's worth a shot at 4-3. I liked um, Matt Hicks taking Puka Nakua 4-2. That was my primary target early on this fourth round because I like Nakua's upside in that Robert Woods role, um, even where it's the same number now. But I think Deuce Vaughn is a nice secondary consolation prize there because of his ability to impact the game as a runner as well as a receiver. All right. Take us home in the 4-4, Garrett Price. What were you thinking coming into it, and, and who'd you take? Yeah, this was another one that lined up pretty nicely for me. Yeah, Because uh, yeah. I love Dwayne McBride. Yeah. Love Dwayne McBride. Uh, he fell a lot further in the draft than I expected. Like, all of the other guys, I felt like I nailed. Like, he he, he went in this round. He went, like, I, I could have gotten within, like, a half round of, like, most of these guys. I would have been way off on Dwayne McBride. I thought he was going to be late third, early fourth round pick. Like I really thought he had the talent. And there were a lot of guys, a lot of the pundits had him as top five, top six running back right. as well. And Daniel Jeremiah, a guy that I really respect, had him fifth. I think Mel Kuyper had him sixth. Like there were a lot of people that really thought he was going to go much higher. Ends up falling, but there wasn't a better spot probably to fall than the Minnesota Vikings. Sure. There's a lot of rumors that Dalvin Cook is either going to be traded or cut. It's looking a lot like maybe a post uh, June 1st cut here, uh, something like that. So if that's the case, I like Alexander Madison as much as the next guy. I loved his tape coming out, but he's far from like a sure thing. And then other than that, it's like a wide open room. And we've, we've seen these kinds of things happen. How did James Robinson become so relevant for a minute? Well, it's because their starting running back got cut. Another guy got injured and he beat out the third guy. Like, you know, like right, that kind right. of stuff happens. Pacheco, uh, you know, Pacheco last year. Exactly. These kinds of things do happen. So who's a guy that's talented enough to seize that opportunity and, and do something with it. Even if it's only for a year or two, that at least opens up either uh, a running back that I can use in my flex, or, you know, maybe even running back too, depending on how well he does uh, that I can use on a championship team or amazing trade bait that I can trade to somebody else. And now this fourth round pick turned into a second round pick or something like that. So I love getting running backs specifically in the fourth round that are just dart throw ones that could maybe earn a job somewhere. Yeah, I think that was a, another solid answer. And that was going to kind of be my follow up question is, is then how do you handle that? Is it an immediate if it if if they do get a path to potential value spike, are you the guy who's immediately out on the third or fourth guy or the third or fourth round draft pick or, uh, you know, fab guy? A lot of people will just turn and burn those guys. Like if, if you can get up to that second round, they're pretty much out. Is that 
Are you living that life? Or are you? It, it's a case by case basis for me. Uh, chances are I'm willing to to flip it and you know just yeah. take the take the extra draft capital and call it a good day. But sometimes there's guys where I just I like them too much and my yeah. heart won't let me do it. Yeah, uh, Stein, this is part, you know, you should nine times out of 10 make that move. Right. But there's right. it's also dynasty, man. And and if you liked Pacheco, then keep Pacheco. If you like Dwayne McBride and he and he gets an opportunity, then then keep unless somebody does something outrageous. Sure. Or they blow you away for him. Like, you know, there there has to be. I know we get caught up in things and don't bet on outliers and yada. It's like, don't bet on every outlier, but if you want to bet on one outlier because that's your guy and you like them, that's okay. Like yeah. we're still should be having some fun here. Now, if you're playing for $2,000, then you should probably do all the, you know, all the, uh, only the smart things. Uh, right. Right. <laughs> no but, dumb things. Yeah. allowed. The $2,000 league isn't as fun. You know, one of those F's is for fun. Uh, but <laughs> yeah, with the, with the $2,000 league, you probably gotta be a little more smart about it and, turn and burn get some capital but i mean who there's not that many people playing for that and most of the people aren't playing for any money so you better be having the most fun you know what i mean like right so was there was there any guys like was would puka have been a pick for you at four four over mcbride or is there i'm not a big puka guy um there was musgrave uh or not musgrave uh shoemaker Shoemaker. would have definitely been been the guy there but you guys did uh, a great job snatching him here (laughs) Uh, two guys that I, I like that went later and I, you guys got one of them too. Look at you guys. Uh, Michael Wilson. I do like quite a bit and I, I take a lot in the fourth round and Xavier Hutchinson, another yeah. one just because of the wide open depth chart. He did good things on tape. I liked his combine. Uh, so, you know, those two guys are, are other frequent fourth round draft picks for me. Uh, but Dwayne McBride, I, I tend to lean the running back there because you know what you have quicker and you can figure out real quick, like, Oh, this guy sucks. I can cut him off my roster. Those right. receivers, they take so long to develop sometimes that they're just soaking up that that dead roster space longer. So and and the hit rate is honestly higher on running backs uh that are taken on day three than receivers. So that's another thing for me. Yeah. Was there is there any other quarterbacks here like DTR? And are you a Browns guy? I am. I, I even got my uh, Joe Thomas Hall of Fame shirt on. <laughs> Very good. Yeah, is there a quarterback in the fourth round that you're that you're more interested than than other people, or or not really? really? Like the super flex thing. You know, obviously, I've hit it hard with with two of my four picks, but it's also it's like to a point. Like at some point, I some of these guys I don't ever see actually playing. So give me a guy that I think could actually end up playing yeah. versus a guy I never think will play. So like the super flex value part of it only goes so far and so deep. Right. All right, man. Well, that'll that'll wrap up your picks. Appreciate you. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, guys. All right, Corey. Tell us where we can find you on the last pick and then how'd you wrap this thing up? Yeah, youtube.com slash fantasy stock exchange. I wrapped this thing up with a uh, little homer pick. Uh, I'm a Tampa Bay Buccaneers fan, and I took a guy who I think is going to make the team. Uh, I could be wrong about that, but Sean Tucker, uh, running back from Syracuse, obviously went undrafted. Dynasty Debbie Darling for the last couple of years. I think we were all kind of shocked when it happened. I'm assuming it was medical reasons why he went undrafted. Heart condition, I think, was flagged at the NFL Combine. But when I ran, you know, my running back models and things like this, like his film had some warts on it. I won't lie. Like he didn't have the best film in the world, but he showed up quite well on paper because Mm -hmm. this was a running back that carried a big workload that was productive as soon as his freshman season, very productive as a sophomore, fell off a little bit as a junior, dealt with some injuries and that kind of thing. But, you know, commanding a high level target share in the 90 plus percentile. And, uh, you know, he was a good athlete. We didn't really get to see it on full display because he was recovering from injuries. But I mean, that Mickey Mouse combine he had kind of showed you just the type (laughs) of athlete that he that he can be, whether those numbers are accurate or not. He's a good athlete. He checks the box from that perspective. And uh, and this backfield in Tampa Bay doesn't have a ton of early down competition. They've already designated Leonard Fournette as a post June first cut and Rashad White was one of the more inefficient on the ground running backs. I think he's a great receiving back, but he's not the type of running back you want to feed 20 carries a game to. He's the type of running back you want to give like a DeAndre Swift workload to in the best case scenario where he's like a 10 carry, you know, five to seven target type of guy. And I think Sean Tucker 
his best attribute was his ability to kind of carry a lot of carries on the ground. And I think the Bucs could use that in their backfield right now. They have guys in the backfield outside of Rashad White, but they're all kind of, you know, Chase Edmonds. Like they're also pass catching type of guys. None of them are like early down ball carriers. And I think Tucker was a third to fourth round talent in the NFL draft. And had they spent a third or fourth round pick on him, we'd all probably be projecting him as a mid second round pick right now but we're getting him in the fourth round because he went on draft. And I get it. It's risky. He could get cut and be on a different team, but you know, it's worth the gamble at this point in time. You got a a guy with a three down skill set who's a good athlete and a good profile. I'll take that shot in the the four or five. Yeah. That's what, that's what, that's what the fourth is for. Right. You know, exactly. Um, What, what was your feeling on Tucker before, like in ranking wise before pre-draft? Yeah, well, in the in the third round, I talked about Chase Brown being my RB six. Sean Tucker was my RB seven, so he was right behind um, those guys behind you know Chase Brown, Roshan Johnson, Tank Bigsby, Zach Charbonnet, Jameer Gibbs, and uh, Bijan Robinson pre draft. So that's from a talent perspective. I thought there was like a huge cluster in this class between those guys that I just mentioned, and then you add in like Kendra Miller type, you know, Tajay Spears, uh, Zach Evans. Of course, a lot of people liked him. Abana Kanda. There's there's just a lot of running backs in this class. Mm-hmm. For me, Tucker profiled as as one of the best, you know, eight backs in this class. But he obviously has to tumble down the rankings now um, without the draft capital of you know anything being an undrafted free agent. You mentioned uh, Kraft before. No, was this the, just the homer pick, or would you take Kraft fifty fifty split there in in a lot of leagues, or would it always be Tucker? I, I I would probably take Kraft ninety percent of the time. I just okay. wanted to have some fun with this one. I uh, I Kraft I thought was the third best tight end in the class. So I I had a I had a very high grade on him from a tape perspective. I thought he did everything well and he was a great you know like I thought his my comp for him was like a Pat Fryermuth plus. I thought he was like a better athlete than Pat Fryermuth, but kind of a similar skill set. Mm-hmm. So I actually think and I thought he was better than Musgrave too. So I, I'll fade third round Luke Musgrave and just take Tucker Kraft in the fourth because I think he was the better player. And it almost kind of reminds me of the situation we saw in Baltimore where they took Hayden Hurst in the first round and Mark Andrews in the third. And that year was my like first time ever watching prospects. And I was like, I think Andrews is much better than Hayden Hurst. Yeah. And that kind of, you know, paid off that way. I think once you get these guys in a training camp, like nobody cares where they were drafted. And exactly. Tucker Craft is the better player, in my opinion. So I'll just, I'll take the round discount. If they were going, you know, face value at the same pick, then it's a different story, but you're getting a round discount on Tucker Craft also. So yeah. he most likely would have been my pick here had I ne- needed a tight end or, you know, if this was a tight end premium or if I was just actually, you know, drafting a real team, I probably would have went with Craft. Yeah. So I, I, I agree. Um, I, Craft, I think could maybe Musgraves could end up being better and, and might be the better athlete potentially. Uh, but Craft is, is, seems more ready and more polished at this point. So I'm, I'm fully on board with with skipping the Musgraves and, and taking the craft there. Um, if McBride was available, would there be any interest in McBride? Dwayne McBride or Trey McBride? <laughs> uh, Dwayne, Dwayne McBride. Yeah, uh, Dwayne McBride is definitely interesting because of the whole Dalvin Cook situation. Um, it's kind of a similar spot, though. I mean, you don't, seventh round versus undrafted free agents, not really going to sway me draft capital wise. Um, McBride was right in there, kind of same skill set, same type of, uh, you know, grade for me pre-draft. I think it was like my RB 10 or something like that. He would, he would definitely be interesting. I think the path to touches is pretty similar. So it would be like flipping a coin. I think McBride needs a Dalvin cook trade to happen. And then he could maybe split a backfield with, with Alex Madison. I think that would probably be a good combo there. Uh, whereas mm-hmm. Tucker, I think if he if he's the player that I saw at Syracuse, especially as a sophomore, he could absolutely just outright win the, the second best back on the yeah. team. Doesn't really need anything to happen. Yeah. Um, how about, all right. I, I got maybe two more questions here. How about Wilson? No, no intrigue with with Wilson here going fourth round was a third round real draft pick. Uh, thoughts on him? Yeah, I mean, if you're going like the process pick, quote unquote, would be third round receiver versus undrafted free agent running back. Mm -hmm. I I understand it again in the fourth round. I don't think a fourth round receiver is going to bury me that much because he's Mm -hmm. going in the fourth round for a reason. And the reason is that he didn't produce at all in college, which (laughs) as I mentioned in the second round is like the most predictive thing for wide receivers. And I get it. He was like dealing with injuries all these years and you know, he's got a big physical skill set. I think he's more likely just like a Nikhil Harry at the next level. Like I I just don't think he's going to be very good. I think he might, might start for a year or two there in Arizona, and then they're probably going to look to move, like you know, upgrade their receiver core. I just don't think he has a very, very high ceiling and a very. I, I just don't anticipate him killing me. 
passing on him, but I could be wrong. He's got the size, yeah. you know, he's a good athlete. All right. Last question. Any, any quarterbacks that would intrigue you in the fourth round here? Yeah. Um, Jay Kaner was a guy that I liked when I was watching uh tape pre-draft. I thought he had like a, a pretty complete skill set for a, a day three quarterback. And I, you know, new Orleans isn't probably going to be in a position to move off of Derek Carr anytime soon. So it's not like I expect this guy to start, but you know, if he became a like if Derek Carr were to go down for any reason and he had to start games, then I think he'd be a legit like I don't want to use the term like this year's Brock Purdy, but I think he actually had a similar skill set to what Purdy had, which is that he was kind of just good at everything. Smart quarterback. He scored high on the S2 scores and all that stuff. So I think Hayner was accurate. He was you know, he could run an NFL offense and that's kind of I think he'll be a long term NFL backup. Not really all that valuable in Dynasty, but. Um, I think he's interesting. And then uh, DTR also went to the, the Browns a couple picks after me. Mm-hmm. He's uh, he's an interesting option as well. But I, I, I think Watson's an elite quarterback. So I like, what yeah. are you going to get out of DTR? Right. All right, man. Well, good stuff. And uh, we appreciate you. Yeah. Make sure you go check out the fancy stock exchange. Get them to 20, 20 K. Appreciate Start it. Up. Thanks, guys. Yeah, man. Ray GQ back at four, six. Took a tight end in the last pick. How you feeling yeah. right now? Oh man, I'm just we're we're ready to get out of here. You know, we're <laughs> we're 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 uh, we're turning on the lights. Started the bus you know? up. Yeah, yeah, we started the bus up. We're cashing out. You know, we're we're cashing out everybody. It's time to get up out of here, man. Four six. It's time to go. Um, I'm looking around the board. You know, Sean Tucker, UDFA, and McBride. I don't know. Deuce Vaughn is smaller than my son. You know, <laughs> I just. <laughs> Dad's on the, his dad's I, on this coaching I, staff. <laughs> I, I, I don't know what to do here, but at this point I'm looking at what's left. And again, tight end premium and, and nothing that I had planned to, to draft two tight ends from the same team. My God. Uh, but I went ahead and went back to green Bay and took Tucker craft uh, tight end that I liked even more than Musgrave through the process. Right. But craft yeah. got drafted one round later. They spent a two day, two picks on two tight ends. Um, interesting green bay but i mean Kraft is pretty damn athletic in his own right i think he's a more complete tight end than musgrave and i don't think that anybody would be shocked if we go look you know three years from now we look back and he's by far the best tight end on that roster so um the the bet here is one of them has to be good right at this point (laughs) one of them has to be good and uh, that return on that outcome as i look around at what's left like there's no way DTR becomes anything fantasy relevant. Michael Wilson, you know, what we know now, I kind of like the upside, right? Had, had I know, if I knew then what I know now, I may have considered Michael Wilson there. I really would have, you know, he had day two pick Arizona, no DeAndre Hopkins, but yeah, I, I think as I look at what's left, I think crafter Wilson was the play. How often do you get to handcuff your rookie tight end with a rookie tight end, you know? (laughs) Uh, It it may be the stone worst uh, strategy, but you may only have a couple of opportunities every five years to get something like this done. And what's the what's the likelihood that they're both day two picks? You know what I mean? They're both drafted on day two. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't hate it, especially the way you've kind of been illustrating how you like to play these these last two rounds. I mean, I, I, I'm no problem, and especially since the tight end has, a, you know, gets the extra half point in this situation, I'm fine with stabbing on tight ends here for the last two rounds, like kind of like you've been alluding to. And I mean, shit, Kraft could, Kraft could get you a little something early, and maybe you trade him away, and you still have Musgraves waiting in the wings, you know? Yeah, and. Again, what else was I taking there? Like uh, DTR, right. like, <laughs> I mean, come on, man. Your boy Jax was making a strong case for for, for Clayton Toon uh, with hey. maybe having some, maybe having a little bit of juice. And now maybe uh, Aiden O'Connell, maybe he's got some juice with some Jimmy uh, listen, news there. Listen, listen, I picked up some Clayton Toon, right? Because here's the thing. The moment they're like Colt McCoy starting and Kyler would be back, I'll just drop him. Like, I just know immediately. Mm-hmm. I don't have to waste right. a roster spot. But in the event that Colt McCoy, something happens, and then, oh, my God, Clayton Toon is starting, I've got some Clayton Toon. I went out, I've got quite a few Clayton Toons. And the beauty of a player like Clayton Toon is literally, like, once you know that he's cooked and he's inactive, you just cut him. And no one to pick him up, and you just cut him. Like, it was right. that, it was a risk-free, risk-free bet. So um, I like I like some Toon there. I'm fine with that. Um, the back of the fourth round, that's cool, man. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I like Tucker Craft right there. I felt like that was. Yeah. I think that was a steal yeah, right there. Yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, that would be a point where at you know I know you're probably not into it, but if he was hanging around at four six, I, I'd, I'd trade into the fourth to to try to get Kraft there. Like I have no problem with that. I I think it's tight ends different, right? You know, you're not trading into the fourth to go draft an undrafted free agent running back, sure. right? Like you're trading in, like you're talking about a guy that did get capital that does has the the requisite athleticism, profile, athleticism right? The, yeah. the, the profile, like you're like, and there's probably going to be some opportunity, so. Mm-hmm. I think this is a, a unique case, but I think the bigger the bigger point to illustrate is even in a 1.5 tight end premium this year in particular, if you just faded tight end for the first three rounds, you still have two day two tight ends here in the late fourth. You still yeah. have Tucker Craft, and listen, I didn't, I didn't, Britain Strange, I would I would have lost money if you would have bet he was be second round pick. <laughs> Nobody called that, but sure. you still have a second round tight end tied to Trevor Lawrence at the back of the fourth. It's just that's right. the point. No, they're with, not with the potential. The, the the I mean Evans or uh, Ev- Ingram. Ingram still hasn't signed the, the the tag, and there's only one year. So I mean there is even a path, you know, semi quickly. And we know Doug Peterson has a history with being. Look at what he just did for Ingram right there. Boom! Immediately was back into, you know, at least a startable tight end for your fantasy lineup. I mean, think about that. You, If you literally just faded tight end, you could have been like, you know, I'll give up a, you know, three next year. Let me go get Kraft. Let me go get, like, that. those yeah. are the bets. Those are the, those are plus EV bets right mm-hmm. there. Like, I spent nothing and the expected value is like double my return based on this slot. Like yeah. it's a, it's a smash. You craft strange. I don't know if we've missed any tight ends that got some capital, but that's where you, you what load up on the tight what ends. Your, what's your th- f- closing thoughts here on if, if Washington was available, would you, would you kind of move yes. in for him I, or yeah, I, I like big wash, right? He is what he is. If he's good, he's going to be the tight end that finishes the year with like 43 catches, but he's got 11 touchdowns, right? Mm-hmm. Cause he's just so big. Like you're right. just, which is not a good thing to bet on touchdowns, but he's a big body, so I want some yeah. wash in case he's good. Have you seen right, those so Twitter highlights? You know they're pretty good. <laughs> uh, would you, <laughs> Would you trade into the fourth for for Washington as well? Just sticking with that kind of same tight end th- mindset, or not really? Just just because just, the capital on the other two. Just dep- just just depends on like the the if let's say this let's say it were two point uh, reception let's mm-hmm. just say hypothetically or start two. And those guys were both around around 310. I would try to get in then. If if Washington and Schoonmaker and Kraft in a start two tight end were both hanging around in that 310 range where Washington went, right. I would have tried to move there to get one of those guys. I'd have been like, give me Schoonmaker, give me Kraft, give me Washington. Like I'd want yeah. those guys. Yeah, I'm moving, I'm moving Kraft and Schoonmaker above Washington. And I'd put yes. Washington down in the fourth round and yeah. be cool with that. Hey, but at the end of the fourth, I'll trade up to smash some strange, you know? <laughs> sure. <laughs> sure. All right, right. Tell us where we can find find you and uh and, and we'll get you out of here. Yeah, man. Appreciate y'all having me on. You can find me on Twitter at Ray GQ, and then you can find me on YouTube at Destination Devi. All right, appreciate appreciate you. you, man. All right, we're back. We're wrapping you up here. All from the seven spot. Uh, give me give me the handle and where we can find you, and then give me the pick. Yeah, absolutely. So Mike or I here, you can find me at Dynasty Zoltan FF on Twitter, uh, or check out the uh, Dynasty Zoltan podcast. All right, so four seven wrapping up. You said you were a little more excited about this one. Yeah. Uh, and I haven't, to be honest, haven't seen too many people be excited nor draft him a whole lot. And yeah. I've only been in a few. I'm not at, in 185 so far. <laughs> Just 83. Um, but-, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, who, who'd you pick? So uh, I picked uh, DTR, Dorian Thompson Robinson, uh, quarterback out of UCLA. Um, and I did this for a few reasons. Um, as I mentioned at earlier picks, especially in the fourth round, you're looking for just someone who can ever get some tangible value. And what I like about DTR is, first of all, it looks like he's locked in to being the backup quarterback there this season, which you can't say for a lot of rookies. And I look at the situation where, number one, there is there's some volatility to this Deshaun Watson conversation that I don't know if people are just done talking about, but let's not pretend that something can't come back up so that so I'm treating him like let's just say a more injury prone quarterback as a guy who might miss some time and then you look at the fact that maybe he is just a more injury prone quarterback he hasn't played in a few years he does have kind of an athletic style he gets sacked more than almost any other quarterback in the league 
And I look at, at Thompson Robinson. I really liked his film out of UCLA. He wasn't actually even on my list in, to scout. But while I was watching Zach Charbonnet, he flashed a little bit for me on film. Um, he's not the most, uh, I guess, progressed prospect. Uh, he played in a little bit of a weird system at UCLA, but he's a very good athlete. He shows good poise in the pocket. I liked his ball placement a lot. He doesn't get through reads very well and makes some poor decisions, but you know, if I'm taking a guy, if really, if I'm using any fourth round pick, I just, if I can get a potential starter who I think if they start would be in a system behind a very good offensive line with some good weapons, who was probably going to run for, you know, 30, 40 rushing yards a game from quarterback. That That's the type of long shot that I want to take a shot on in the fourth round. Yeah, I don't, I like the idea. I've been, I've been as the drafts end, if, one of the leagues had free agency or a couple of them had free agency. And uh, I think DTR is the first stop for me in a, in a super flex situation. Yeah. Was there any other consideration um, leading up to this or somebody that went in front of you that were like, was like, damn, or was, is it always, is it always uh, DTR here? So DTR is my target in the second half of the fourth round, because like you said, I can almost always get him. I think he's actually my most rostered rookie at this point, which I'm, I'm comfortable rostering a, you know, fourth round dart throw at 50 plus percent. Cause if they hit that's, you know, an awesome profit. Um, Sean Tucker and Dwayne McBride would probably be the two guys that I were yeah. a little bit sad that they went um, just because, you know, it looks like Dalvin Cook might get cut. Rashad White hasn't proven himself in any way. And both of these guys, you know, were thought of as potential third round picks at one point in the draft process. So I would have liked to take a shot on those running backs. But after the two of them are gone, I'm focused in on uh, DTR. Yeah, those are definitely the last two gasps at running back uh, yeah. for me as well. Um, but if Kraft was there, would you take the other Packer tight end or not? not I would have taken Kraft, uh, mostly, I mean, obviously I love tight ends, but <laughs> more, more than that, I would have taken Kraft because I think he's probably going to play over Musgrave year one. I think he's way more ready. Musgrave is coming off an injury and, you know, had, I think 500 career yards receiving, yeah. I think one career touchdown, something like that. So I wouldn't be surprised for Kraft to get the job out of the gates. Uh, we don't really know what that offense is going to look like, but again, sure. if I'm looking for immediate return of value, if I could flip him for a future second after, you know, week six, when he has five catches, you know, I'm, I'm happy about that. All right. Uh, all right. I got one, one more question. We'll stick with the tight ends. No, no strange love here for you. <laughs> Uh, absolutely not. I think he's a, he's a sixth uh, offensive lineman. S -s same as Darnell Washington. Yeah, man, for a tight end hoarder, I thought you would love some strange. Got the capital. Yeah. <laughs> Got the, the <laughs> listen, the, the draft capital shook me, but yeah. I think it like I, I, I honestly hadn't hadn't really known anything about him before the draft, but I, I watched him after the draft. It seems like they just view him. They're going to play Evan Ingram and Calvin Ridley and Christian Kirk a lot in basically the slots. So they need a guy who can literally just block at tight end. And, and strange, I, I saw a few highlights where he was, you know, moving after the catch, but he doesn't look like he's going to be a real receiving option. My, Mike's a risk averse kind of guy. So he probably stays away from the strange. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I've been taught that I can't promise I've stuck to it, but I, I do. Yeah. My best. <laughs> uh, yeah. The draft capital. I think that's basically what it comes down to. Well, people selecting strange both heads aren't always risk averse you know? no no absolutely true. not that's um, true. I, I would say that if, if you're gonna take kind of a late second tight end who went there in a bit of a surprise i'm, I'm targeting luke schoonmaker yeah i mean i got him at 312 there and i thought i was basically just value at that point so yeah he's yeah that's certainly more athletic than the guys that they have there now it's got good capital it seems like an easy path yep um, absolutely so agree with zach that. likes or not zach uh Dak likes the tight ends as Dak well. Does like the tight, you know. The thing with Strange is that you know maybe he he does get a year to figure it out a little bit in a kind of a tight end friendly. You know, Peterson's always been a little bit of a tight end friendly offense. Evan Ingram on a one year deal. Um, so there, I guess there is a little intrigue for me there, but again, don't know all that much about Strange. Um, yeah, there's the situation's not bad. Like Ingram's on a one year deal, and they basically play different positions, but yeah. I, I, I just don't think he he has the the upside I'm really looking for. Like he, he could fall into the end zone a few times and get, you know, a tight end 18 year because tight end sucks. But sure, I don't think sure. he's ever going to, you know, make make your starting lineup and you'll be happy about it. 
Yeah, and I, I haven't looked at Washington, I don't think, one time in a draft for, for myself. And maybe that's a bad process by me. Um, no, it's not. Like it's a great process. <laughs> I I got in so many arguments before the draft when people were arguing Darnell Washington over Laporta, over Musgrave. And I was so happy that the draft vindicated me. <laughs> he, 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 he is the pure sixth offensive lineman. Like, I get it's cool that he's athletic, but... I'm sorry. If you have a 8% target share in college, it's not just because you have a good tight end above you. Like there are other reasons and it's because you're not very good. Yeah. Oh, uh, well, all right. Well, that's it then. I, all I need to know about Washington. Good. <laughs> right on board. I hey. saw one Twitter highlight w- of a clip and he looked pretty good. You know what I mean? So I think I'm going to go. With <laughs> no, that. he did. I, I, I bet it was the one where he hurdles over that dude on the sideline. That and was there was a, some crazy one handed catch too. Like, yeah, no, he, he does some cool stuff. I feel like he'd be a guy <laughs> who would dominate in a pickup basketball tournament just with like that football build. And you're like, Oh my God, what are we going to do with him? But yeah. I don't think you get fantasy points for that. So. You, you indeed do not. Um, but uh, all right, man. Well, I appreciate the time. Thanks so much for draft. Like, you know, this is a nice time commitment for everybody. And, and we appreciate you uh, hopping on here and taking the time to draft. Uh, so, again, just where can we find everything uh, on the way out? Yeah, just find all my stuff at uh, Dynasty Zoltan on basically uh, every platform you can look at, uh, except for TikTok, because I am uh, still protesting. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we just we just watch stuff on Instagram two weeks later. Like, yeah. Exactly. Like, I mean, like adults. It's, <laughs> like adults. <laughs> exactly. After, after all the kids have uh, filtered out what's yeah, good and yeah. what's not, they send the good stuff to, to Instagram. That's, that's yep. right. And then another month later, it's on Instagram or it's on YouTube Reels. So yeah, uh, exactly. it's on YouTube Shorts. So <laughs> we're back with Jeff Bell. Four eight last pick. What's going through your mind here? Because this is an interesting pick here. I, I'm I'm interested to get your take on it. What, what, what were your thoughts here? So I took Michael Wilson, wide receiver out of Sanford. And Michael Wilson is a player that um, I caught on very quickly prior to the senior bowl when I was kind of going through. So we did the football guys rookie guide and I handled the wide receivers for that. And so it's one of those that it was a later on a Saturday night. And I, I watched like 60 wide receivers to put this together. And so when you're watching tape, tape after tape, and you're seeing, you're kind of getting into the depths from what have been established at the top. And you're dealing with these guys that are lucky to be drafted and occasionally a player flashes and and you're like, oh, all right, we got something here. And so you dig a little bit deeper. You maybe find, figure out who else is kind of on that. And I know Matt Waldman was somebody that was on him like yeah. immediately when I was on there. And so that made me feel pretty good. Matt's a, somebody that I've done some work with in the past and somebody I look up to quite a bit. And he's a very well established name in the rookie space. And so um, and then Michael Wilson ended up catching uh, day two capital. And so um, I, that's probably the only thing outside of like Kayshawn Boutte is a weird one this year. Mm-hmm. I'm not really considering a, a wide receiver in the fourth round unless they have day two to capital. And so Tank Dell is a guy that kind of lands there sometimes, but Wilson is a guy that you can usually get there. And I think people see it as being blocked with the Cardinals right now. But I mean, it was just today more rumors came out that Deandre Hopkins still wants to be traded. And we've seen rooms flip very, very quickly in the past before. And there's a new coaching staff, new GM, new regime entirely. And with uh, Arizona. And so while Michael Wilson might look very blocked between Rondell Moore and Deandre Hopkins and Hollywood Brown, we see that flip quickly. And so if you are late in the late in the fourth or even undrafted, you can, can grab a guy in day two and people might push him down because either they didn't know about him prior to the draft or they didn't know. They look at that Arizona room and say, well, he's not going to get any targets. I think that's where you really want to step in because going day two says a lot about how the team evaluates the player, what they're thinking long-term with him. And so outside of continually grabbing running backs and maybe some of these tight ends that might've also gone day two, Wilson's a guy that I do really like a lot as a late target. And I've ended up with him on a lot of my yeah. rosters. I bet. Cause it does seem like he's one of those guys that kind of just forgotten and gets pushed down in a lot of these drafts. I don't, hate the receiver room per se in Arizona necessarily, I guess. But I mean, I think they're all under five, eight. He gives them, if Hopkins leaves, you know, he's like the only size that they maybe even ha- outside of Trey McBride, who I, I do like Trey McBride a good bit uh, moving forward. But uh, I think, I think Wilson's a nice, a nice swing. And, you know, he has been, you know, we've talked to maybe half of the guys so far in this while we're uh, talking to you and, and Michael Wilson has been a little bit of their punching bag of, not a lot of those guys like him. So I was very interested to get your take here. And I think, you know, 
I think with the capital and, and all the things you said, I think, I think it's a very, uh, look, I mean, the rest of these swings are, are just that. And I mean, at least you got kind of something to hang your hat on with some capital and, and maybe a little bit of size coming into that room. And, you know, that room, that's the GMs and, and the coaches not really tied to those other guys. We see this all the time. They're, they're not part of that regime. Um, they're trying to get their guys in there. Um, I'm not going to lie and say I know a ton about Michael Wilson. You know, I know that he was he was fairly athletic and and maybe a little banged up through his college career, so maybe didn't quite blossom into what you wanted to see. Yeah, Stanford was not a very talented football team last right. year, and so he was hurt as well, and so that held the production down. And so if you're somebody that's really deep into college fantasy, he might not have been on your roster. And so it's there's a reason why there's is some fade on him from some um, segments of the community. But um, I think that you touched on it very well with the size in the Arizona room, and I think that people are kind of not catching on on Arizona because they're n- not – Cliff, Cliff Kingsbury is not there anymore. They're not <laughs> running right. an air raid offense anymore. They brought Drew yeah. Penzig in from the Browns and the Browns ran a lot of 12 personnel. And so Arizona set up with those two tight ends with McBride. And as Zach, Evan, as Zach Ertz gets back, they have those tight ends there that they're going to run 12 personnel. That means they need bigger wide receivers outside. They don't have so much room for the, you know, the Smurfs playing in the slots because I think that they're going to be a lot more physical team than people realize and probably not throw quite as much as people realize, but when you look as they turn over that wide receiver room, I mean, Wilson was a pick of this regime and Wilson is a guy that has rare traits relative to the room. He's a player that can win outside. He can work inside as well. And so I I think it's uh, maybe it takes some putting the pieces together there on projecting him because it's not neat and tidy on, well, if he could be the wide receiver three right out of the gate. And and so like a guy like Puka Nakua, like he, maybe he's the Ram wide receiver too. And you can tell yourself that story, even though he, he went very late day three, whereas Wilson went again, day two. Right. Yeah. I like it, man. Uh, well, good stuff. We appreciate you uh, coming on and, and spending some time with us. Thank you very much for having me. All right. Last pick for you. Four nine bringing us home. Scott Connor, what do you what do you got for us? So four nine. I think this was my favorite pick, not just because I'm a Kentucky fan, but because Shockingly, I don't know if you guys have heard it. Quite a few people have been talking up this player yeah. over the last week and a half or so. Uh, but I took Chris Rodriguez at the 409, my third straight running back. Everything I talked about at 209 and 309 from a process standpoint, uh-huh. he fits. He's going to make the team. He sounds like they drafted him for a very specific role, even if that is the Backup to Brian Robinson, which is not a sexy role to begin with. With Antonio Gibson maybe being the third down back or change of pace, whatever you want to call it. Gibson gets some love too, you know. I I like <laughs> nothing new, nothing new there. I like all of the running backs on that roster, and I think with that, Rodriguez is a very black and white pick. You're gonna know if there's ever a chance to play him. You're gonna know when to play him. He's a bell cow. He's a 225 pound running back, a workhorse in the SEC for years. There's going to be a couple games where it's like, okay, Brian Robinson can't play. We need you to go out there. And it's not going to be pretty, guys. It's going to be 22 carries for 65 yards. He might get a dump off catch and you hope he gets a touchdown. The question is, is he better than Benny Snell? He is better than Benny Snell. Yes, oh. there is an interview from 2019 where Benny Snell, he is asked, Benny. who's the best who's the best running back on the team? And he actually says it's freshman Chris Rodriguez that no one had heard of before. And then you watch him and you go, damn, he looks like Benny Snell, but he's like faster and yeah. bigger, you know? So I think he's better. I think he's probably a little underrated. It's just what he does is not that preferred in the NFL right now. But I think if there's a place to be, it's like next to Brian Robinson. <laughs> sure, sure. Because they are they're already using a guy like that. So if right, there's a right. season you could get something out of Chris Rodriguez, it could be in the next year or two for exactly the role Brian Robinson was in. And they're similar players. Like if you watch them, Robinson was a little more athletic when he tested, but I think Rodriguez has better long speed and is probably a better receiver. So I, I think it's uh it's an interesting spot because I don't think a lot of places would have drafted Chris Rodriguez 
for anything more than a camp body. But I actually believe why I believe that Ron Rivera was like, yeah, we, we like what Brian Robinson did. Let's just get another one of those just in case he breaks down. Cause the way they're using them, he's going to break down. Yeah. Same question as all the other ones. Was there a player that would have been left that would have made you not take Chris Rod- Rodriguez there? Yeah, we would have taken Tucker Craft for sure. Tucker Craft, okay. just like just like Luke Musgrave. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but I found myself with a lot of Tucker Craft because people have just assumed, oh, you know, they took a tight end around before him. So he's way more ready than Musgraves, I think. I agree. I think he. I, I I agree, and I think that's more of a coin flip situation than the ADP is giving it credit for. I mean, we've seen it before, right? We've sure. seen it with Isaiah Likely, Charlie Kohler. Mark Andrews, Hayden Hurst. Like there's been plenty of times where like two tight ends are drafted and we're not sure who the best one is, but yet the ADP says they're confident it's going to be one and it, then it doesn't end up being the other. So I, I think Tucker Craft is uh, probably an even better value than Musgrave. And if I could have got him at the 409, like I would have been fine leaving the draft with just him and never taking another tight end. <laughs> yeah. I I love your uh, tight end conviction there. Um you were speaking beforehand. Chris Rodriguez seems like a guy that's pretty much been your your fourth round guy uh, in just about every draft. So that's just is that just because of Kentucky and knowing a little bit more about him, or was that through your process in the off season? Uh, it's part of that, but I think it's also he got sixth round draft capital, which I, honestly I was surprised he went in the sixth round. I thought he might go in the seventh or undrafted, but. You know, it is what it is. I, I do think you could take Dwayne McBride for the same reason. Yeah. You could take Dwayne, Dwayne McBride and make the same argument that, you know, if the, the Vikings move on from Cook, which it sounds like they are, McBride's going to make the roster. Now, what does that look like? We don't know. But I think if Cook was out of the way, you'd probably say Antonio Gibson, Brian Robinson, tougher to penetrate touches for Rodriguez than Ty Chandler and Alexander Madison would be Yeah, for McBride. So I think you justifiably people will take McBride over Rodriguez, but I think effectively they're the same thing. So I would have yeah. taken McBride in some places too. I don't want to go all Rodriguez. I'd be fine kind of taking, you know, 60, 40 in those two players. I think people are back to the public opinion. People are more familiar with McBride because some of the pundits had him higher up in their rankings. And, yeah. you know, if you quick do a quick search on McBride, you can see the number of rush yards there is, is pretty staggering. Um, for him now, now Rodriguez was was very good through some seasons as well. So I, I would probably take McBride and, and Tucker uh, instead of Rodriguez there most times. But I, I do like the Rodriguez stab. Is there any quarterbacks that you in this fourth round would have any interest in? I mean, I saw Dorian Thompson Robinson went. That's that's just one of those like you hope he wins the backup job and. If he ever gets a spot start, you'd probably prefer him over other guys because he can because he can run. But if you guys had to really weigh, who do you think has the best shot of actually getting starts this year? It's got to be Tune Stetson. I think Stetson Bennett or Tune are probably now. It depends on your league. There's some leagues where you draft Stetson Bennett and he starts, and people go, "I don't want him." Yeah. So yeah. it's like, okay, no one will even give you a fourth for him when he's starting. <laughs> so do I sure. really want him? But yeah, if you're in you those leagues where... You might need that start though, you know? You, you might. I think we're getting to the point where if you run out of the running backs, the next best thing is probably the quarterbacks versus... And I've made this mistake too in some drafts where I'm drafting Will Mallory and I'm drafting Josh Wiley and Zach Coots. And I'm like, I like their profiles, but... What what's the path with a seventh round tight end? How long are you gonna have to wait? Right. You're gonna stare at that roster spot and go, man, anytime I need a quarterback off waivers, that's the one that's gonna stick out and go, I'm gonna drop them. So <laughs> yeah. Don't put yourself there. Don't draft. I don't know why people draft, you know, Puka Nakua, Xavier Hutchinson, like those types, a, a bunch of players that we didn't get drafted here. Hutchinson, Trey Palmer. Like I see those guys getting drafted, and it just feels like you're setting yourself up for, oh, cool. He had a catch in preseason. Let's wait till 2024. Yeah. Where the quarterbacks and the running backs, I think, are very quick roster spots. Like, you know, you're going to want Jake Hayner if he's the Saints backup. If he's not, I probably don't want him. Like, yeah. it's it's very black and white. I, I have a roster spot if it doesn't work out. Receivers, you usually just get trapped. 
So I, I, I'm a big Xavier Hutchinson guy. I'll trade into the 412 every time to pick up Xavier Hutchinson. Now we have to have a bigger roster and a bigger bench to, to you know, right. if right. not, then I don't care. You know, FFPC, there's 0% chance I'm, you know, I might, I might in the seventh round just take Hutchinson because I have a seventh rounder and then he's, as soon as, uh, you Most know, waivers cuts. run around, uh, he's my first cut. Or usually I'm trying to leave a spot open for that first waiver in FFPCs. Um, right. But... I like Hutchinson because I like the tape and the profile and you seem like you play a little bit more binary uh, where it's, you know, I, we talked about this with Garrett who was just on there. Like, I don't want to bet on a bunch of outliers and take, but like it's, it still is fantasy football where if I like the guy and I can get him for super cheap, I'll throw him on the roster because he was my guy. And I, you know, I put the time in to watch him and I, I, I did really like what he has. And I do think that core is kind of wide open. They got old Robert Woods. They got, uh, the dude from Nico. Alabama, they got Nico. Who's all right. Mechie. But Mechie. And like, so really who's established there that, that, you know, that I feel like there is a spot there now, whether or not you like the Texans offense is, you know, TBD. Uh, but so there's no, no love for like you, two guys you mentioned there, Puka and Hutchinson are both guys that I'm kind of intrigued. Cause it does seem like there is a, like a path to year one of playing time. Is that not something that you're, Oh, I, I definitely think there is. And I think if you are in the fourth round of a draft at any point, I don't care what the position is. It's a pick that's cheap enough to where if you can justify like Kayshawn Boutte, there's a reason he should get drafted in every draft simply based on the name. Same with Sean Tucker. Like if you can tell me there is a path because the community likes the name, that's almost more powerful than a fourth round pick. Like the potential flip asset where I can turn a fourth rounder into two thirds. That's right. better than it's probably going to be really hard from a production standpoint for someone like Puka Nakua to go, oh man, he's worth a second. You know, it's it people are too smart to fall for that based on one play, one catch, even one game. So I think if you get in the fourth round and you can justify, hey, this is just a I'm trying to take advantage of the masses that might like a name. That's fine. And I do play very binary, very data driven, don't care about players, right. uh, which makes it nice when you're playing with a lot of the people that were in this draft because they play differently. Yeah. So the drafts are a little more intriguing. Not everybody's. I mean, there would be not a bigger nightmare than you go. Hey, Scott, you're in a brand new league. Everyone's going to play exactly like you. <laughs> yeah. Now right. I go, you know, you know, There's the no best edge. way to. Yeah you know, the best way to win is do everything that I wouldn't do. <laughs> yeah. Right. Cause I'm the only one doing it. Like, right. I, and that's why I do appreciate people with different processes where it's like, man, we're both playing dynasty, but we're literally doing it in a completely different, two ways. different games, basically. So many ways to skin this cat, which who's, who's skinning cats. Every time I say that <laughs> phrase, I'm like, where does that even come from? But so, so when you I, psychopaths, I don't know how to exactly phrase this, but when you come into the rookie draft, do you have a, a board set or is it you're just really just trying to price it out by values? And I'm not say, elaborating this very well, but like, do you have a big board when you come in or do you kind of let it settle out and figure out where those pockets of values are and you kind of just live in, in those areas? Or, or do you have a very like strict, hey, I, I want these guys, these guys or these guys or nobody? Yeah, I mean... If everyone could see my setup, I have four monitors. Uh, I have 50 leagues. So at one point I was in 26 drafts at a time. So I have them up on the monitors. I have a, uh, I do work for DLF. So I have access to their DLF sync tool, which essentially I don't use it for any other reason, but it has a list of every rookie and you can sync it to your leagues. So I literally can just refresh it and see like, okay, who is gone? Mm -hmm. Who is there? It's just like a running list with a basic order of, okay, I know this player's here in this league. Cause li- you know, literally if you're on a couple different platforms or whatever, it, you can miss players pretty easily. Oh, for sure. So I'll have that up and it'll literally be next to the tab where I have my draft screen. So I have, you know, 45 tabs open at one time and I'll just click through them. You know, I get notifications or whatever when I'm on the clock and it is very much just like draft by draft. The only downside is I don't have time to like literally go and grind trade ins and trade outs in every single one of them. But I did, I did do a little bit of pre-planning this year in terms of like, okay, when I'm going to be in this range, I only want to make X amount of picks. 
I don't want to make every third round pick. I don't want to make every fourth round pick. When I start get to that late third round range in this draft that I know is going to be in the third round tomorrow, maybe I get ahead of it. I'm willing to trade that 307 for a future third and fourth. Yeah. And just forget about who's going to be there. I'll just get out in that league, bank those picks for the future. So it is very, very process oriented, but I do have a board and I do have at least a filter to where I'm not going to miss players. Nothing worse than being in too many drafts and you're like, damn, Fuck, that I guy was that available guy. at yeah. 209 in that league. And I just took him 203 in this other league and I could have yeah. traded in because the guy gave away the pick for, you know, the 209 for two thirds or something stupid like that. And I missed it because I was too busy and I didn't have the screen. I didn't know he was available. So I think you, you got to have a process if you're doing that many leagues. Otherwise, you, you're just shooting yourself in the foot. Yeah. All right, man. Well, we won't take up any more of your time. We appreciate you. Thank you for sticking through this draft. It was it was a lot of fun picking your brain and, and listening to your process. Yeah, appreciate you guys organizing. A lot of good uh, dynasty minds in here. Interesting draft board and uh, looking forward to see how the entire thing plays out. All right, we're back with the 410 with Mason. Thanks for uh, thanks for doing this. Thanks for all the time. Bringing the flock over to the FF Dynasty. What was the uh, what was the pick here? Went through, took Britton Strange, said, okay, it's the 410. What the hell am I supposed to do? And looked at a player that goes round two of the NFL draft to Jacksonville, where we don't necessarily know the long, long-term future with Evan Ingram. What, what does Evan Ingram look like in 2024? What does Evan Ingram look like in 2025? I know Trevor Lawrence will probably be pretty damn good then. In general, I hate taking rookie tight ends. I hate taking these roster clogger type players. But in reality, it's the 410. We're getting a tight end that goes in the second round to the Jacksonville Jaguars. I mean, if we're just talking about expected hit rates, what else am I supposed to do here? Yeah, I mean, you get a, you at least get some decent draft capital with with strange, I guess mm-hmm. that could help your percentage out. I'm, a, I'm presuming. Um, what, is there anybody else that, that might've went a little earlier? That's like your fourth round guy. In reality, not really. I mean, okay. Sean Tucker would have been really exciting if Sean Tucker had the medicals clear out and he went like round four, round five of the NFL draft, right? Like I think Sean Tucker checks a lot of the boxes, but once he is an undrafted option, then at that point it's like, okay, well, He's probably not going to do anything. And I understand that in general, we want to be taking our running backs in rounds three and four. That way we can maybe find the next Isaiah Pacheco, right? That can Mm -hmm. make an immediate impact. But I mean, going back to what I was talking about previously, if you're looking at an NFL team, invest the second round pick into a player, we can assume, yeah, he probably has a decent shot to eventually get on the field. And if we're getting that guy at the 410 in a tight end premium format, I think Britain trades actually a a pretty strong value here. Yeah, I think so too. I've, I've seems like I've been scooping them up on this kind of this these last couple of picks here, in uh, in the couple of rookie drafts that I've done. So I, I don't, I certainly don't hate it. It's a stab at a, at a tight end in a tight end premium league. Um, all right, well that wraps. How many how many drafts have you done as we wrap this uh, up right here? I think I'm pushing about nineteen to twenty right now. Yeah, we had uh, Zoltan. I didn't see Zoltan on uh, last night, and it was. 83. Well, that's like, how many leagues he's in total. Or some crazy number. Yeah. Jesus. How do you even, I need a second. Which if you've already done 19 or 20 rookie drafts, you're probably, you've probably got a slew still to come, right? No, no. I, all my rookie drafts are essentially right after the NFL draft. I'm no. not doing any rookie drafts in August. Oh, I, I, no? love, I love the rookie I draft love the late rookie, rookie draft. Yeah. No, for, right. for me, I'm going to have so much work in terms of. <laughs> yeah. Real, real yeah. work. Whenever the we're closing on the football season, I can't have any rookie drafts then. All right. Well, so that's like a stipulation to get Mason in the league. When's the rookie draft? Yeah, because <laughs> I have a May cutoff date. Yeah. All right. Well, well, our man's putting in work over there. Yeah. We appreciate your time, Mason. Can't thank you enough for coming on and, and joining the show and being a part of this uh, this uh, monstrosity of an effort of a show that we're trying to put out here. <laughs> yeah, man. Much appreciated. Of course not. Thank you so much, guys. All right. We're back with the last pick before the last pick. We got yeah. Jax Falcone bringing us home and then I'm the last one. So who cares? Uh, yeah, so who gives a shit about you. What were you? What were you thinking? <laughs> not a not a whole not lot me. of uh, <laughs> not a whole lot of uh, quarterbacks have gone here. What it seems like, uh, you know, if you've been following along with you, I think I think everybody knows what this pick might be. So who you got? Yeah, dude. Yeah. If you follow me at all, you know, this was Clayton Tune. Look, I don't even. 
like Clayton Toon. I don't even know who he is. Like, I don't know <laughs> right. who he is, where he's from. <laughs> Couldn't tell you anything about him. I don't know if he's white or black. I don't know what team he played for. I don't know if, how big he is. I know nothing about Clayton Toon other than he was drafted in like the top 150 by the Arizona Cardinals, whose starting quarterback is not uh, like he's not even ready to play at all. And right. whose backup quarterback is Colt McCoy, who checks notes also sucks and is also hurt. Also so, injured. Yes. <laughs> so, they, and if they're tanking, what, what do they even want? Like a steady as she goes, 38 year old backup Colt McCoy starting for them. It, there's a, there is a world where Clayton tune starts, by the way, I do know what he looks like and where he comes from. He played at Houston. Made Tank Dell look pretty good. Um, he was pretty prolific. He's a little bit older. He's like 24 years old, but he's got a good NFL body. He's got a pretty good rushing upside, too. So if he does get on the field, it's possible, like a 10% chance, maybe, that he's good. It's probable that he's not good. That's the more likely scenario. But with the 4 11, I might have just drafted a guy who's going to start a game, maybe even week one. In the mm-hmm. NFL, that is ridiculous. So those are the reasons why I draft him. It has nothing to do with him as a player because that doesn't matter at all. If this was the UCLA kid or Jake Hayner and his awesome photo shoot in this spot, I would have <laughs> taken them over right. Clayton Toon. This isn't a player yeah. take. This is a, 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 a an opportunity take, and he has the opportunity to start. So slam it on Clayton Toon late in your draft, 100 out of 100. Do it. Yeah, I, I, I like the – I like the spot. It's a value. Very Scott Connor of you there. Uh, yes. Although, although I don't, I don't think he <laughs> yeah. liked the pick. But it, the, the theory behind it is is right he there. He didn't like it. What did he say? Well, Late round quarterback. I, I think he was. Oh, he he was I think he was very much in the vein of the running backs uh, as as we talked sure. about the last pick. Uh, sure. Strapped but I mean, you know, later. Brock Purdy. You know, we've seen these types of guys. I mean, I'm not saying that this kid's Brock Purdy. That's that's ridiculous. But we've seen actually where he got drafted is like Russell Wilson, Dak Prescott. There's been a couple guys who've been good. You know, I don't know that he's good i don't right i mean he's pr- like i said he's probably not good but so isn't the running back you're drafting here right the running back you're drafting here probably sucks too so for me i've just been locking up clayton tune just on the potential that he's a starter and then you could you know a lot of people are like well what are you gonna get for him i'm like i don't know better than the four more than a fourth round yeah more than the 411 yeah. Yeah. There, there more is, than the fucking 411 dude there there is probably 50 percent of kyler murray owners that don't even understand that he may not be back and that Colt McCoy is also injured. And like like all of a sudden, like we could be week two into training camp or whatever, and all of a yeah. sudden tunes go and the, everybody's in in the the, the the narrative starts getting pushed. Yes. Like, hey, this guy could be the starter. Uh yes. you know, and, and it's like, oh shit, should I have should I get him at least? Should I should I trade a three? And now all of a sudden you you moved up one round for free. Right. Uh to, to at just, the very you know, least. Right. right. And generally with a guy like this, I mean, I'd rather like package him because, you know, it's hard to get a two, as you point out. But look, if he's good, you're going to get more than a two. I mean, what's Brock Purdy worth right now? A one for sure. Like, it's hard to sell. You're not buying Brock Purdy from anyone for a single second. Purdy doesn't get hurt and it's fucking through. It's it's wheels up. You know, I mean, right. You know, it's just unfortunate that, that it ended that way. Yes. I mean, Desmond Ritter right now. What's Desmond Ritter worth? Yeah, I, I'm interested in Desmond Ritter just to see. Like, I haven't, I don't quite know what Desmond Ritter's worth, but you're right. You know, nobody, Sam ever, Howell. S- somebody last year said exactly what some of these other people are saying to you about Ritter. Like, why would you ever draft Ritter? And they were right, maybe with Malik Willis. And right. Uh, who, who else was in there? Matt Corral uh, was Matt a, Corral. It, yeah. You know, I took shots Ma- with all those guys late. Sure. In the, you know, just Corral and Howell and Ritter and all I mean, how right now is going to pan out. Like if you yes. took how last year at four eleven, it's you could probably, there is a world where you could maybe squeeze it too. And I like the, I, the package is for sure a better way to go with players like this. I yeah. agree, but there is certainly a world where there may be, you know, week two, Sam Howell could fetch you too, you know. Well, he, he, I'll tell you what, you're not buying him for a third. I've I've in many leagues I've sent out multiple thirds for Sam Howell, always rejected immediately. So whomever is is holding on to Sam Howell is definitely not interested in selling for a third. So you're gonna have to pay at least a two to get him, which means that if you're if you're selling, you can get a two, I guess. I mean, I don't know how many yeah. times it's gonna be offered, but right. if you actually get into a Look, that's the other thing, too, with these guys. When I send these offers, sometimes this is dynasty game theory, but I'll send an offer of like two thirds for Sam Howell. They just flat decline and move on. I'm like, 
wouldn't you want to suss me out a little bit and be like, right. hey, came, bitch, what are you really? Yeah. Yeah. How many Let's, people are coming at you for how, you know? Right. And if so, if that's if there's more, then that's even more of a reason to sell, sell the hotness. So, yeah. you know, a lot of these guys, it's like, you know, is Sam Howell really going to win you a league? Like the likelihood of that is nothing. So, like, if you can get my stupid ass to, like, give you too much, take it, move on, you right. know? So, yeah, I, I, I totally agree. But that's the point is that you're going to have someone in your league that sees him start a game. If he does, what if he starts and he's pretty good? Right. Like, I don't know, just like kind of okay, good. Yeah. Someone's going to be like, I think he's going to be good. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so, somebody, so that guy. Right. Somebody's fired up or, and somebody's or fired. maybe they're fired up and their quarterback went down. Maybe you know, maybe maybe they had Tua like last year and they were yep. they were doing all right and cruising along and they were like, well, I can't get anything. I don't want to go too too expensive, but Sam Howell, I like what I saw there and, you know, whatever. Yes. Um, yeah, I mean, it, you know, there's I can't imagine there's a pick that was, you know, made around those the the fourth round that's that that did as well as those quarterbacks could have. So, yeah, I'm I'm with you a thousand percent. I mean, the tight end's probably a good one because Dulcich was probably drafted back there. Mm-hmm. Uh, Chig, Chig was drafted yeah. back there. So that's what that's why I'm saying with Tucker Craft and, you know, Schoenmacher is probably the better picks earlier in the third when I took um Evan Hall, but Love. you know, so that's the whole point, though. But this is the game theory behind it. You know, you're not really tra- drafting players; you're drafting assets. Um, you know, take the best player available. Take that player that's going to, you know, increase in value, or at least has the opportunity to increase in value sure. over the short term. Yeah, no, I like it, man. Uh, all right, one last plug, and we'll get you out of here. Um, where where can we find everything? I am I am Jax Falcone. You can find me on Twitter at Dino Game Theory. We are at theundroppables.com and find my awesome podcast, The Undrafted, wherever you listen to your stupid podcasts. <laughs> well, spoiler alert, I took a wide receiver with the 412. So, <laughs> idiot. What an idiot. Who'd you take? <sighs> Xavier Hutchinson. Yeah, waste. See ya. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man, I appreciate it. Mr. Irrelevant, that's Case Cam over there. If I learn one thing from listening to all these dudes, it's that the pick that you just made, there is no way he it was could ever be so good. wrong. Didn't you know that you cannot just, take a wide receiver in just the fourth throw round him out. rookie draft? Just There's throw no it out. chance. I, no, and I will. Tr- I'd trade in. I'll trade in every single draft. At you definitely can't be take, trading into the fourth round. I'll Casey. trade in every time at four twelve and take Xavier Hutchinson. Uh, we'll, we'll attack it a little more in the re- in the in the recap show here. But you know, a lot of these guys address. Basically said, I don't know if attack is the right word, but well, I mean, not, I didn't mean it. <laughs> I meant it in an in an address way. But you know, we'll with all due respect. Uh, not that much respect. Well, you can say um, whatever you want after you say that. Yeah. Well, say the then, Geneva Convention. If, if we ever have a morning show, that may be the or like a, a radio show that we like we do three, four times a week. That's two hours long. It might just be called with all due respect because it'd just be a bunch of just shit talking. <laughs> but I said with all due respect. I don't know what yeah. you want me to do. Yeah. I mean, like, you know, go no offense. Yourself. You know, <laughs> no offense. <laughs> no, none taken. You are um, one but, pathetic loser. <laughs> But, you know, I'm, I I really Damn like Hutchinson. Hutchinson right here. One pathetic loser. I, I I like Hutchinson. I did the work on him. Um, and, you know, I did the work on pretty much everybody in this draft and plus some other guys. And Don't you know you, you know, can I, just get some metrics? You don't have to do that work, Case. I really I really like what I saw with him. Um, he absolutely slayed this year. Um, but throughout his process, he was, you know, a nice short to intermediate guy who's really good on the play action and a really good blocker. And I said before we did this, before the draft happened, like he'd be a great fit for the Niners, losing Ayuk and being a guy who can come right in and block him. Look who drafted him, the Houston Texans, coming from that model where, hey, we, you know, maybe we drafted Tank Dell, who isn't the best uh, blocker out there for maybe what this, what the potential scheme and, and what we're trying to do. Well, you bring in Xavier Hutchinson, uh, who gives you another big guy like, like Nico, who you can roll out there in your, in your two, uh, sets and your two uh, wide receiver sets there and you got two blockers two guys who can attack on the play action and and Xavier's really good in the short screen with the run after the catch uh, was a target hog this this past year and a uh, good good intermediate uh, quickness uh, there and, and and pretty pretty decent uh, route running in that short and intermediate uh, really works space well so uh, I, I'll take Xavier Hutchinson time after time after time. And, and for you to sit here and tell me that, that you guys all learned your lesson and you can't draft these wide receivers. I, I, I think, I think you're wrong. I think you can, um, it, you know, yeah, there's going to be running backs that I'm going to take over them, but then I'm going to get to a certain point where like, Hey, listen, I get it that, that you're saying with the handcuff there's, you know, there's, it's, it's more, 
presumable that when somebody goes down, this guy will come in. But we've seen it time after time after time where there's two guys in the backfield who are the quote unquote handcuffs. And we don't really know. And that ends up being the other guy that you don't fucking have, um, you know, so. It, you know, you, you draft a Banacanda thinking that he's going to be your handcuff for Brees, which nobody liked anyway. But I'm just saying, like, if he did, then maybe it's fucking Michael Carter. You know, it's just it is what it is. And I, I just, you know, I understand the philosophy of saying, you know, that the that the wide receiver, it's it's definitely a lot more wide open of who's going to get the shot. But uh, this is a, a wide I, I'm going to you got to navigate the landmines. Fucking Houston's depth charts wide the fuck open, man. Like it's, it's, they got Robert Woods, who's 32 and had an Achilles injury and an ACL. Yeah, what think, about Robert Woods? You know, not too long ago. And then it's Mechie, who's a rookie, uh, you know, who's coming back from a, a, a crap situation that he got dealt. And I think Mechie's pretty good. Nico Collins, who's, you know, had some good spurts and we think he might be good. And then it's fucking Tank Dell, who, you know, is a potentially a little bit of an outlier if he works out from height oh, weight sure bmi thing and i like him I, I have no problem taking tank Dell for the same reason where he's a savage route runner and they cj stroud supposedly wanted him and he got decent capital i have no problem taking the shot on him uh but you know hutchinson uh, also has the same chance of you know i know it's a six round receiver as opposed to third or fourth whatever tank Dell was i liked hutchinson more than i like Dell. so i'm I, if i can get him at 412 i'll take that and, and take my chances on 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 Hutchinson uh, carving out a role, especially for the things that I mentioned in the beginning, because I do think he can have an edge because of potentially what this, you know, Niners esque system will be in Houston uh, for, for being a good blocker, being good on the play action. So, well, you lost me after I'm taking a wide receiver with my fourth. Round yeah. Pick, so I didn't even hear any of the rest of that. I'm ready mm-hmm. to get the FF out of here. Okay. <laughs> Sick of this show already. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Nobody heard that anyway. So, yeah. Yeah. All, All right. right. Well, let's hit this uh, pre-recorded outro. All right. Whew. Well, that is indeed a wrap on that. We can put a bow on it. Uh, we appreciate you. Make sure you like, subscribe, comment below. Um, had a lot of fun. It was very interesting. Had some old homies on, met some new homies. Uh, it's, it's always always a good good time getting all these different minds together and getting to speak to them and and just see kind of their processes unfold and i think i think we got a good uh thousand foot view of of kind of where the fantasy space is got all you know a couple different avenues to go down and a couple different uh ways to uh navigate your draft uh so we'll we'll, i'm sure we'll touch base with a few of these guys uh, throughout the off season and talk other things rather than rookies but we appreciate y'all uh be sure to uh, go hop over to the Discord or or the, the Patreon, get the $5 holler, get the shirt at RevelryBrewCo.com. Support the team, support your boys. Appreciate y'all. Peace.